Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Annie. We're so thrilled everyone can be here this afternoon. Understand it's a Friday in the summer. Um, especially want to thank and introduce our um, amazing uh, colleagues from Chicago who are joining us today. Yasmin Dominguez, the Media Partnerships Coordinator at the Chicago Reader. Savannah Hughley, the um, Chicago Independent Media Alliance Manager. And Tracy Bain, President and Co-Publisher of the Chicago Reader. And so I'm going to turn it over to Yasmin right now, who's going to give us an overview of their collaborative fundraising campaigns. And then um, we're going to talk a bit about plans moving forward. And we'll then open it up to questions at the end. In the meantime, please feel free to drop um, questions in the chat and we'll note them and get back to them toward the end. And um, we hope folks will raise their hands also and um, ask questions as we go along also, because we really hope this will be a conversation. So there's there's time for that at the end. Um, so yeah, Yasmin, I will turn it over to you and share my screen uh, to get your slides up. Okay, thank you, Yossi. Um, well, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, as, as Yossi mentioned, I'm Yasmin Dominguez, and I'm the Media Collaboratives Manager at the Chicago Reader. Um, so I co-manage the Chicago Independent Media Alliance uh, along with Savannah, who we'll talk a little later on. Um, so before we really jump into the philanthropic part of, 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 uh, of SEMA, I kind of want to give a rundown on what SEMA is for those who may not be too informed. Um, so SEMA, our acronym, we're a project of the Reader Institute for Community Journalism, which houses the Chicago Reader newspaper as well. Um, this was started in the summer of 2019, and we officially launched, um, and what I mean by officially launched is that we had our first and only in-person meeting February of 2020. Um, I don't, and I think we all know what happened a month later. So because of the pandemic, we switched and went virtual and had monthly and now bi-monthly Zoom meetings with various publishers um, and owners of uh, local media outlets in Chicago. Um, so that really helped create a, like foster a sense of community in a time where it was really hard to feel in community um, with the lack of in-person contact. So um, that really was a big part of SEMA early on in its early phase. Um, in a nutshell, it's a partnership of independent local and community-driven media entities. Um, and we really come together in the spirit of collaboration <laughs> especially in creating new revenue streams um, and raising visibility of our media partners. So you hear a lot about uh, media editorial collaborations. The thing about SEMA is that we don't do, we rarely do uh, editorial collaborations. What SEMA really focuses on and puts all our energy into is creating and coming up with new sorts of revenue streams that could help our media ecosystem and raise um, smaller outlets visibility in the process of doing that. Um, and also SEMA has sort of become a like an advocate and representative for Chicago's local media outlets um, on a state level and more recently on a national level as well. Um, so what we do in a nutshell, like I mentioned, advocate for local media. Uh, what this session is about hosting our annual joint media fundraisers. We also assemble member to member trainings to uh, so focus on anything development related. So let's say we have um, one outlet that's really good at digital advertising. They will, we will, we were able to fund them to host like a one hour workshop where they train other SEMA members on their skill set. And then after we connect them one on one. So uh, whatever outlet needs assistance has like a one point of contact for that specific need um, in training. Um, more before we used to host, uh, we still do host group advertisement buys uh, between members and clients. Happy to answer more questions about that. Um, and the first time we're doing this this year is we're building a visibility campaign to help increase um, the viewership and audience base of our members um, right before our um, annual fundraiser. So that will take place in September, and our our goal with that is to turn um, new eyeballs and new followers into new donors for this year. So we're pr being pretty intentional. So our visibility campaign is September that will bleed right into our annual fundraiser that takes place the first two weeks of October. Um, so we could do the next slide. Um, so our membership number. So right now we have 69 media outlets and they represent 81 media entities. So what we mean by that, so um, a good example, we have Growing Community Media, which is one outlet, but it owns several other um, neighborhood papers. So we, we count them as one. So that's what we mean representing 81 media entities. 
um, our membership really, really varies. We we don't um, every like what I mean by that is like we have nonprofit newsroom, independently owned LLC. We have a combination of like over a hundred year old traditional newspapers that have been in, in the city for a while, like the Chicago Defender or Polish Daily News. And then we have like independently independently produced podcasts like E3 Radio that are fairly new, Ergo Radio, and video production um, media like uh, Soapbox Productions and Organizing or Street Level Media too. So it's really a hodgepodge of different members. Um, and that is, because of that is how, why it's easier for us to raise everybody's visibility. Um, it also has created a space for local media to become aware of each other and to partner together um, in different ways. So although we don't host editorial collaboration, um, they can choose to collaborate together outside of SEMA because we have created a space where they can make those formal introductions themselves. Um, involvement, what does that look like? We never charge membership fees. There's absolutely no membership dues, never will be. Um, and we host a lot of campaign committees as well. So uh, something that we found really helps people participate is when you create committees for different like sections. So we like a website committee, a campaigns committee, a fundraising committee, um, and that really increases members' uh, engagement and participation in projects because they feel ownership of the things that they are participating in doing. So good strategy to increase participation is something that I've learned these first two years, well, the first two years of the three. Um, and yes, we are building an internal steering committee that will most likely launch next week. Um, so we can do the next slide. So why was SEMA created? Um, Tracy, feel free to jump in because uh, Tracy Bain, who is on this call as well, this, this was her this is what her idea in 2019, and I was brought on to help um, to help create it. So I know one of our main reasons for doing so uh, was to create a direct response to the industry's um, decline in advertising revenue. Um, and at the time that we launched, there was two major outlets in the city that closed down. Um, I believe DNA Info closed down before this, but that was that was a that was a pretty big loss in our city, and as well, um, Oi, which was um, Chicago, Chicago's uh, largest Spanish producing newspaper that was coming out of the Chicago Tribune, closed I believe like a week before we launched. So really, that's it. That was concerning to us, and we really wanted to create a space that could advocate to make sure that doesn't doesn't keep happening. Um, of course, we had no idea what was going to come in 2020, so the timing was was pretty spot on. Um, and really, we we aim to create a successful path to a self-sustaining media ecosystem. Um, that is really our end goal and our mission of SEMA. Um, so now we can do next slide, and I'm happy to pivot great into our fundraising tactics. Um, so just some takeaways from the first fundraiser that we had in 2020. Um, these are some stats right here. Feel free to look at them. I, I can talk about each one. Really, the reason that the SEMA fundraiser was created um, was an emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic in, I know everywhere, but specifically in Chicago, really rocked um, like local independent media outlets, just because our local outlets are very reliant on advertising, local advertising. So when a lot of local businesses, um, you know, temporarily shut down or permanently shut down, all events were canceled literally in one week. Lots of advertisers pulled out their ads. Lots of papers were severely impacted, had severe financial losses. And we realized that we had to do something about it. So we went ahead and, and, and Tracy suggested we have to do an emergency fundraiser. So really our first year, we learned a lot, but it was a fundraiser that we put together rather quickly. Oh gosh, I don't know, probably in like a month and a half to two months, which is pretty gnarly to me because <laughs> it takes a lot more time to prep something this big. That It was just kind of an emergency um, an emergency uh, method strategy that we did. So we were able, able to dedicate a lot more time to it in 2021. Um, but in 2020, um, we had an average of $160,000 total raised. So $60,000 of that came from um, the matching portion from five foundations. So five foundations pulled together uh, the total sum amount of 60,000. Um, 
and so that we use as a match. Hello. Now, Good morning. Um, oh. now, now we did raise $101,000 in public donations. Um, so that was directly from the public. And that was from 972 donors who uh, collectively raised the 101,000 mark. Um, 43 SEMA members were involved. This camp, the first two years, the campaign was one month long, um, usually around the May, June, or the spring, early summer timeframe. And our slogan was journalism for the people, by the people, and our hashtag, and which is what our website is, Safe Chicago Media and safechicagomedia.org. Probably one of the largest takeaways we had was that two thirds of our donors, two thirds of the 972 donors gave uh, to all. So something that's super important that I should mention is that this campaign, you can donate three ways. So you can donate to one outlet, you can donate um, to multiple outlets in one transaction. So let's say you wanna donate like $20 to the Chicago Reader, $10 to City Bureau, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is one way you can donate as well. And then the two thirds of donors decided to donate to all. So what that means is they say someone donates $100 their $100 was evenly split amongst 43, the 43 uh, members in the fundraiser. Um, so that was a pretty big takeaway, knowing that two thirds of our people wanted to donate to all our, all our outlets. Um, so some major takeaways um, was that collaboration not only works, but it brings new people to the table and it makes um, it makes funders feel good about funding your, your efforts when it has, when collective uh, fundraising has such a, like a result of 160,000, uh, foundation support not only continued onto the next two years, but it did increase as well. Um, so that was a pretty big learning point for us. Um, it does not take away from individual fundraising efforts, it complements them. So what I mean by that is that some uh, outlets in our fundraiser, including the reader, um, have, have this theme of fundraiser going on, as well as another one going on right after or during or before. We just had a conversation with one member who was kind of doing that um, this morning too. So it complements that. We, we, we try to be strategic about that way, um, about that. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so some takeaways for 2021, which is last year we raised more money than we did in 2020, which was really neat. <laughs> I was not expecting that personally because there was so much uh, energy behind donations in 2020 due to the nature of like everyone was in the emergency state. So the fact that we raised more uh, surprised me in the way that it was proving the model we had created to be uh, sustainable outside of an emergency setting. Um, so for this year, we did, for last year, we did raise 77,500 in matching donations. So that's what I was trying to explain earlier that um, don't, uh, foundations like collaboration and they like to fund that. So we did have more money in the uh, matching portion of that. Um, now, when it came to public donations, we had 95,295 and 931 donors. So a slight dip in that factor. Same number of members involved, same time frame, one month long campaign. And our slogan was investing in local media equals funding your community. Same hashtag as last year, just to keep that same, um, uh, like, uh, I can't think of the word, but like people would recognize our, uh, our branding in a way. And then we had a new one as well. So local media are essential, still kind of playing into the uh, pandemic and what was going on at the time. Um, what was new this year was we did have a triple match incentive um, because that is because we did have more foundation funding. Um, and we extended the campaign by one more day. Um, we did one final push that last day and the last day resulted in 200 more last minute donations, which really kind of pushed us up to the number we wanted to get to. Um, so takeaways. Uh, Tracy, it would be great if you could talk a little bit about um, like the takeaways from the triple match and how uh, how that helped out our campaign that year. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what we, you know, since it was a month long, we, we saw a little lag in the middle, which is typical. 
Um, and we had a lot of match left. And I think it was one of our members, I think City Bureau said, hey, how about we do a, a triple match uh, till we uh, hit the matching Mm -hmm. And it really incentivized people um, this year because knowing ahead of time if you have a triple match can be tricky because people will hold back their donations until that. So now that we've seen it be successful, I think this year we're going to do the triple match on the front end. And then at the very end of the campaign, if we're needing a final day of incentives, we, we might go to that. But it's not a guarantee because what happens is we if we run out of the match money, we run out of the match. Um, how it works is no one member can get more than 20% of the match. Um, and we've never had a problem with that. Um, it's worked out well, but if we, the triple match could mean that we, you know, too much runs out too quickly. So it's a balance and we're going to learn a lot each year, especially being two weeks this year. Mm -hmm. um, so we can take it to the next slide. Okay, so this is the exciting part to me. Um, all the work that needs to go into building something like this. Uh, right off the bat, if you are curious on starting this in your city, I would say please put aside five to six months of planning period, of building period before it launches. Um, things will go wrong. And what I mean by they will go wrong is building a donation website for a fundraiser at this size is tricky. It, um, it requires a lot of testing and it requires a lot of time. Um, so just for learning from the reason I'm giggling is because there was so many like setbacks that happened with the website that uh, just made me learn that the really finishing this donation website like a month before your fundraiser is the best place you could be for it. Um, we used a web developer called Dojo, who uh, I know someone was, uh, Jane, you were asking about like what web platform we use. Um, we, the thing about our website is that we didn't use any sort of like fundraising platform, like any traditional one of that sense. On the back end, our website actually serves as an e-commerce site. Um, and each member is viewed as a product so that it can be a little tricky with it. Um, it was really hard for me to find examples of websites that have um, like of a website that has like a like a one stop shop almost of like multiple outlets to donate to or or like products or anything to donate to. So once I realized that there wasn't really anything like this out there. Um, I knew that we had to um, kind of build this from scratch. So that's why our developer found it easier to go to an e-commerce uh, way. So I know Tracy's discussing, we do have, because of that, we do have to do a lot of like manual, like hard coding on the back end to really like, to really be able to um, like share out reports that are, that have important data for foundation. So what I mean by that is, for example, like right now, if you download a report from the back end of that site, it has like the, the name of the donor, who they donated to and how much, but it doesn't have like their emails, for example, because that that in an e-commerce site is not an important part of a report. But for a fundraiser, yeah, it's really important having someone's email. So, so basically um, what our developer has to do this year is hard code that into our back end um, because there's really no system that, could, that exists to be able to host so many different uh, like media outlets or, or outlets or whatever and, and on a site. Um, so yes, our website is safechicagomedia.org. I invite you to take a look at it as I discuss it. Um, and and so it, uh, that, that was a pretty tricky part of it. I would definitely say building out the website was is crucial to it. Um, number two, implement a fundraising committee. That was really, really helpful this, that past year because I kind of mentioned um, when you give a member of an organization or of an alliance a little bit more um, like power or share that power or authority, um, they will deliver. And some people in our um alliance are have been fundraising for like more than a decade for a really long time and so those people were more than happy to share their fundraising experience and insight um, in our committee setting and so I, I definitely let them take the lead and when they were suggesting fundraising fundraising strategies um, so 
what I mean by that is when you're creating something that involves so many people and so many different types of media organization, I definitely recommend creating a space for those same people to be able to call the shots or make the big decisions alongside you. Um, it really will have a more of an impact for sure. Um, creating the branding, messaging, and <laughs> marketing strategy for a for, for these sorts of campaigns. Um, what Savannah and I do and are currently doing is like almost every sort of decision we make, we run it through the committee. So we have biweekly calls with our campaign committee um, and we run everything through them. So because this will have, this is what we're creating is for them. So we want to make sure that they are making these decisions alongside with us. Um, it also helps hold everyone accountable as well. Um, and people have really great ideas. You're working with a really creative group of people and together you come up with a lot of cool stuff. Um, so I would definitely recommend creating a committee. Um, what we ended up doing as well, because when you work with such different types of media organizations where there, some have been around for so long, some are really new, um, people's levels of fundraising experience are all over the place. So something we did last year and we'll probably do again this year, is we hosted a best fundraising best fundraising strategies workshop for our members before the fundraiser. Um, so that was led by the same individual that led the fundraising strategy. Um, her name is Sean Campbell. She's the general manager of Chirp Radio. Uh, Chirp Radio does a lot of year-round fundraising. Um, so Sean Campbell, along with Andrew Herrera, who at the time was a director of development for City Bureau, both led that training. And that, tra that training was really well attended. I believe half of the people in the fundraiser attended that training and we hosted it um, like one week or one week and a half before our, our actual launch date. So people felt prepared and had time to kind of refine their own market, their own marketing and fundraising strategies beforehand. And again, we did connect them one-on-one -on -one with Andrew and Sean in case they had questions. Um, and we were able uh, to compensate both Andrew and Sean for sharing their time and their expertise with us. Um, so those, these five are really my like best key action items to do before launch. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. So I think we can go to the next slide. Um, our ma marketing strategy um, and Tracy, if you want to jump in here too, for last year, I recall that our main vehicle um, for donations was social media. Um, we did really rely on, on Twitter, mostly Twitter, to really create, um, like that's where most of our, our, our marketing and our, and our talk was, and our, our people were noticing the campaign. Um, Basically all of our outlets, part of their obligation is to promote it in their own outlets. Um, and so all 43 of them last year um, did it in whatever outlets they have, whether that's a podcast or uh, online website or print media, the reader ran full page ads in our print media, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And this year we're fortunate WBEZ, our NPR station here has agreed to come on as a partner. And some of our SEMA members that don't wanna be in the fundraiser because in many ways they don't wanna, they're large enough and they don't wanna be seen as taking away from really small outlets they're still going to support it by donating ads. And so they'll be considered partners of the campaign and not beneficiaries. So especially the BEZ relationship will have ads on the local NPR station in their email newsletter, which is huge audience. And we're going to try to expand those kind of partnerships so that it's promoted beyond the ecosystem of our own members and our own members, employees that promote it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and we really, we try to share, um, like updates on dollar, like dollar updates on social media to let people know how much money was coming in like every other day. Um, we did create special messaging to announce the triple match, the four, the four last days of the campaign. Um, and those messaging and like the delivery of them really led to an influx of donations during our extension period of the campaign. Um, we did create a SEMA MailChimp newsletter where we also sent out weekly updates to how we were doing and making asks. Um, yeah, and our last day really did lead to an influx of donations. Um, so I'm happy to answer more specific questions about the marketing part. Um, there were really a lot of 
playing parts with it. And when you have such a large group of outlets promoting the same fundraiser to, to various out, uh, to, to, to their own various audiences, it really does, it, I think it really is power in numbers. And, and you can tell that donations do come in. Like Tracy mentioned, kind of, if we, oh, actually, can we go to the next slide, Yossi? Okay, so this is some of our, before I get into like the flow of donations, this is um, our look of the campaign this past year. So we did work with an illustrator who um, they are part of our, one of our members, Southside Weekly, um, they're, they're their main illustrator there. So they designed these ads, uh, like the, the, they drew them out and the campaign committee came up with like this slogan right here, like 63% of independent media outlets saw the revenue drop due to the pandemic. Um, so we got that stat because we did survey our members before the fundraiser happened because Tracy and I wanted to get a better understanding of, we were like, if the reader was severely impacted, we just assumed like other outlets probably were severely impacted as well. But what we ended up doing was creating a survey that uh, outlets filled out. And then that's how we were able to draw this, this figure right here. So then we use that figure in our marketing as well. And if you go to the next slide, um, there's another image as well. In Chicago at the time and across the country, um, there was a lot of um, protest going on uh, in regards to the murder of George Floyd. So we really wanted to highlight um, media was, some of our media partners were really covering that um, pretty intensely. So we wanted to kind of showcase that as well. Um, and again, our slogan, local media outlets are essential. So these were some of our gifts too. Um, so we wanted to, this we, we brought out like the last two weeks of the campaign. Um, and we wanted to show people like what a $20 donation or a $50 donation or a $100 donation would mean to an outlet. So um, like 100 will pay a writer for their article, 50 first time contributor. So how we got that info was just by surveying our members and asking them like, what would a $20 donation do for your outlet? What would a hundred do? So based on their responses that they submitted, we created these gifts um, and shared with them ahead of time. Uh, so you may see these gifts again <laughs> when we do the campaign this year. I think we're gonna repeat some of this stuff too. Uh, okay, so this is what I was talking a little bit about earlier on, the flow of donations throughout our campaign. So you could tell that the beginning, um, when we announced, we didn't announce the triple match up until June 7th. You could see there's a big, big difference versus the other ones. So we did have um, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a start in the beginning. And as Tracy mentioned, there was definitely a lull in, in the, the, the like the second week, if I recall, a little bit into the third week. And then our last week is when uh, we announced our triple match and I met, like donations kept coming in fast. <laughs> and so then our, our, last, uh, our last day, you can also see it's bigger than the, all the other ones too. Um, so if we go to the next slide as well, same graph, just a little, same data, just a different graph. Um, and we can go on. Okay, um, so what do you do after a fundraiser, after the fundraiser ends? Um, member reports, those are pretty important. So emails are as valuable as dollars in a campaign like this. So uh, I had to create reports for all 43 of our outlets with the name, email address of all our donors. Um, also, when a website like this is built, a privacy policy is really, really important. So donors know that you will be uh, you know, capturing their emails and sharing it with that outlet. Um, so definitely privacy policy is necessary. Um, we shared donor trends really similar to what I just shared with you all. We shared them um, um, with our members so they could see how the campaign did. Collecting member feedback through survey, really important to me because as the one kind of who alongside Tracy built this out, we always want to, and it's so collaborative, we really try to improve it every single year. So there are outlets feedback on what they think was good, what they think wasn't good, what they think could be better. Um, we ask those questions and then kind of improve the campaign every single year based on their input. Um, and again, as assessing the overall strengths and weaknesses of the campaign. Um, 
And yeah, sending goals for next year collectively together. So as in uh, all members met virtually after the campaign ended, um, and we kind of just set goals that we wanted to reach this year and sent collective thank you messages and individual messages it was really important too, which is why member reports are important. Um, so I'm happy to toss it to Savannah, who will discuss kind of what we're thinking of doing uh, for this year and happy to answer any questions too. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, Yasmin. So I am new, um, as Tracy just said, Yasmin has done all of this um, along with Tracy's help on her own for the last two years. Um, so it's been really interesting to like come in now. Um, I came in in the fall, so um, so yeah, so my perspective is um, sort of as someone who's helping with this campaign, but doesn't have um, notes from like some great reports how the previous years looked. Um, so yeah, so regarding the committee that Yasmin mentioned, we're once again working with a committee this time. Um, our fundraiser this year is going to be for two weeks in October, which is going to be new. Um, in the past, the uh, campaigns were longer. Um, and we are trying to make it a little more participatory than last year's. Um, so yeah, like Yasmin said, we were always worked with committees, um, but this year we're also working to get members to make more content and compensating them for their time. So I think Yasmin and I are like the main dedicated staff members to SEMA, um, but we wanna make sure that we're like compensating and um, treating like working with all of the other outlets and their leaders as um, as like our co like of our co-leaders as uh, in this fundraiser. So we are, and also that allows us to like rely on their expertise. So like Yasmin said, like a lot of people have experience with fundraising, so we're able to rely on them for that. And we're also having two of our members, um, Street Level and Soapbox, Produ Soapbox Productions and Organizing uh, make video content for this year. So we've had really great uh, illustrations in the last year for our campaigns. And this year after some like member feedback, we're showing our like members doing their work and showing like actual members doing their work. So we're using a lot more photos, we're highlighting members, um, we're having members write articles about other members and the work that their outlets do and putting them in their outlets. So for example, um, we're having like the Chicago Reader, a staff member from the Chicago Reader will be writing an article about a smaller outlet, E3 Radio, which is a radio station and podcast. Um, and highlighting them in the Chicago Reader and then also using that to promote SEMA. Um, so it's a way to kind of like bring readers and listeners um, between outlets and also to promote SEMA at large. Um, and as I was saying before too, we're having um, two of our outlets make video content that will uh, promote the campaign and then also just demonstrate to both funders um, and supporters uh, what SEMA is. So that's like a big change from from last year and um yeah i think a lot of the other stuff well i'll see if, if yasmin if you have any other kind of updates on what has changed from last year to this year um as i mentioned we have a shorter campaign and uh we are um yeah i think just having it be more participatory has been our main change yeah one thing i would add is that um how did we do this and also publish the Chicago Reader? Well, we got a grant. Um, in uh, 2019, we got a small grant from, the, from a foundation in Chicago. And then by 2020, we were able to get a democracy fund grant and we have been able to get that every year since to fund a staff person. I would not suggest a paper try to take this on their own without a dedicated staff person funded for this because the the lift we saw Yasmin have to do, there's no way someone that had other jobs at a newspaper or radio, or whatever, could also do this lift well and as quickly as we needed to do. But um, even if it took a longer period of time, it's just a very complex set of things to negotiate relationships between media outlets, et cetera. The reason we knew that we wouldn't even start it without funding is Karen uh, Hawkins, my uh, at the time uh, colleague here at the Reader and I who dreamed of this, had been part of many collaborations before. I'm 38 years in community media in Chicago, and I've seen a lot of collaborations come and go, and, and the ones that really fa fail are not funded for staffing it. So even just having one person, a miracle worker like Yasmin, 
made it work. Um, it probably should have had two or three people <laughs> to start, to be honest. Um, and we're lucky to have Savannah now. And, and um, so, but I would say that's one really big lesson um, is that it must be staffed separately and foundations will fund this kind of collaborative work. Um, and, and so go into it knowing that lesson. Yeah. I would also say too, regarding just how this, how this campaign is going right now, um, like outlets really do, we recently had a workshop where we had um, two of our member outlets um, talk about their social media presence um, and kind of like share with other people in the collaborative how they do their social media. And someone said in that, um, that they never see other outlets within the city or nationally as competitors. They only see them as, as sisters, as, as siblings um, in this effort. And I think that really comes through in how it is collaborating with all of these outlets. When we work on the committee, they've all been excited about highlighting other outlets. Um, they've been excited about sharing the work of other outlets. And they see that as really like lifting themselves up while also lifting up everyone else within the ecosystem in Chicago. Uh, so I think that's been really uplifting. And that also, that's one other point too, to our whole presence as SEMA is like Yasmin mentioned, one difference this year too, is that we're doing a visibility campaign prior to the fundraiser where we're, we're promoting uh, just SEMA as an entity. Uh, we have about half of our outlets um, are, or over half of our outlets in SEMA are participating in the fundraiser but seem as larger than that. And then obviously too, the Chicago ecos ecosystem of local independent media is even larger. So we want to promote both SEMA as a whole and just local media in Chicago. Um, so to do that, we're doing this visibility campaign where we're just sharing um, the impactful work that members do um, and how they work with community members. And we are um, also going to kind of try to strengthen SEMA's year round presence so that when it comes to the fundraiser, we're ready. Um, so we're going to make our newsletter, we're hoping to make our newsletter monthly um, and kind of promote with, you know, try to have messaging that shows people like, here is a plate, like one place where you can access the breadth of work that is done in Chicago um, and kind of like show, show the general community in Chicago the importance of an entity that really shows you the work that everybody's doing and the collaborative work that they do together. Mm -hmm. um, something I would add too is, um, I think people, members in the Alliance got really excited once they saw that things were starting to be successful. Um, and that really increased participation in uh, for the next year. and. Something that was just so cool to me was um, in 2021, because outlets were starting to become more confident in us, we're starting to trust us more, which is super important. Um, and we're becoming more comfortable with each other. They did this really neat thing where it was like, our concept was like of an echo chamber on social media. So we were trying to create an echo chamber of local media on Twitter. So what I mean by that is, um, say like there's one outlet e3 radio so um, so they would shout out another outlet say like the chicago defender for a really good like article or piece of work that they did and then it was like tag so then the chicago defender would tag someone else and then that outlet would tag someone else and it would all be part of like they would all be together with our hashtag of that fundraiser so then the end call to action was like you know, um, don't need to keep doing, to keep promoting and to keep supporting this outlet's really good work. This is what they did. And by the way, this is what this other outlet has done. So because we were, we've been able for the past two, three years to create like a community of local media, even though it was virtual, we still did it. Um, people were a lot more comfortable working together and shouting out each other and, you know, creating that vibe of like good commodity. Um, so I would say that if you do have some sort of alliance like this, um, like bi-monthly and monthly Zoom calls just to check in on each other, I always like to start them off with like in the chat, like say like a really good win or a good success like that you did in this past month or two months or any good article that your reporter has done. Um, and so then they share that in the chat while we give updates. And like that is just a really good strategy to keep people like informed with what they do. Um, we have heard before too, I always love to say this example, but in creating a space for local media, 
um, it does give outlets a chance that normally wouldn't work together to feel comfortable enough to reach out to one another. Like a, an example I have of that is um, one of our outlets is Streetwise, um, <clears throat> which reports about and assists the homeless community in Chicago. Um, and they were they were able, they're just like a monthly magazine that prints, um, and they were able to partner with Rivet Radio, who is really intentional on, um, really good at like podcast production and uh, yeah, radio production. And they were able, they, I know Dave Hamilton, the creative director of Streetwise was able and comfortable enough to reach out to uh, the director of Rivet and offer a, an idea of um, creating a podcast on homelessness in the city. Um, so Streetwise you know, sent their reporter to their studios. The reporter did like all the reporting, like all the all the talking of it. And River just helped produce it and helped cut it and helped edit it. And, and now it's out in the world and has won several awards for it. So that is just a really good example of like, you don't necessarily have to manage everyone's collaboration, just create the space for it and people will collaborate themselves. They'll feel more welcome and inclined to do it. All that needs to be done is a space for it. Um, and I say always just uh, like be kind and be transparent and that, that also people are really receptive to those two attributes as well. Um, amazing, thank you Yasmin, thank you Savannah, thank you Tracy, this has been phenomenal. We've gotten a ton of great questions in the chat also, some many of which have been answered in the chat, but I think we'll resurface because I think many of them are worth digging in a little deeper. And we wanna make sure folks who are gonna be watching the recording have access to some of them also. Um, but I'll start just asking one question, which is similar to what Aurora just put in the chat. And how do you think about stewardship and also continued communication with folks if they donate to the, the group as a whole to the shared fundraiser as opposed to individual um, donations. It doesn't sound like they're then going to get emails from all of the participating outlets, but how are you, are you thinking about ways to, to bring folks back to continue to deepen that relationship with SEMA? I would say that this is an area we have a lot of room to grow. Um, the individual donors to individual members, they will get those emails this year's campaign. We have all the emails for all of the donors. We only use it for this annual campaign. We send a thank you out. And then, so we don't try to interfere with any donors that might be kind of ongoing donors to others. I think as SEMA grows, this will be a question for the membership and how we use it. But we've tried to be really careful not to, to overwhelm those people uh, with any of like, all those emails do not go to the, all the members of SEMA, but they will get their individual donor emails this year. Um, and uh, we also have done training on how to communicate with donors and we need to do more of that because a lot of them are for profits or really small nonprofits that don't have a development team and, and follow up. So um, that is definitely a, uh, something to grow into to on the stewardship side. Yeah, and just to mention, this is just, what we've been talking about but as I mentioned too something we've talked about is having like an infrequent newsletter because obviously we want people who donate to subscribe to the individual uh, SEMA members but maybe having a way to have like a monthly newsletter following the campaigns and in between campaigns um, that highlights reporting that members are doing and can be kind of marketed as a way for like I said for uh, supporters to find new outlets to follow. Um, so it can like put prominent reporting that they're doing um, or work that they're doing or events that they're hosting um, and maybe feature like a member of the month sort of thing. Um, so that's that's one like idea that we're thinking about because we definitely want to not bombard people, but find a way to kind of like retain their interest in SEMA uh, and just the all of our outlets uh, throughout the year. Great. There was, um, I really encourage everyone to look at the chat because there were some really wonderful back and forth questions and answers there as well. Um, one question that surfaced that I'd like to ask Tracy is someone asked why you decided not to go through your local community foundation for this, for this alliance. Yeah, it's really a, a good timing for that question um, from, the, from the audience. Um, we have a great relationship with local foundations. Since I've been doing this work for a long time, even before I took over the reader in 2018, we saw this as a, you know, an opportunity to elevate um, the ecosystem. So we've been meeting with funders since, uh, really since just after I took over about the push for creation of a pooled fund for journalism in Chicago. We saw the uh, 
impact of COVID so quickly devastating our members that Yasmin was able to pivot really fast to do that first annual fundraiser. And I think what it showed foundations is what we were talking about. Like we were able to give an example of how people like to collaborate in the fundraising space on journalism. So our work has really fueled the push for more resources into Chicago journalism overall. And last year, uh, we saw a perfect opportunity to up the game on that. When the WBEZ and Sun-Times merger was announced, we asked our members and some non-members of SEMA to sign a pooled fund statement, which you'll see on the website I linked to, advocating for, for a pooled fund in Chicago to complement the $60 million that was somehow found for that merger. We didn't oppose the merger at all. We think it's a great idea. Some, some members may have opposed it, but we weren't making a statement about that. We just said, oh, this is a great opportunity to lift the other legs of the table here. And we know that funders locally are talking and meeting privately amongst each, each other to look to create a pooled fund in Chicago by next year. Um, and that's because we've shown the work, we've done the work, and we've also advocated at the perfect moment of opportunity when it came to be. So um, we hope that a pooled fund is reality by in mid to late next year. It may then change the dynamics of what we do. We may ask it to run through that fund. It may be a much larger effort that's you know region wide and hundreds of outlets may participate because there'll be the capacity to do that. So we will have, we will share all our lessons learned and make sure that community media, especially really small, mid-sized community media are not forgotten when that pooled fund launches. So now our role will pivot to making sure there's a place at the table. We have a great community foundation here, the Chicago Community Trust. Um, we know that the Report for America has done some good research on community foundations that are looking at doing these things. Chicago is perfectly positioned to do this uh, with the resources we have and learn from what other foundations have done. That's so great to hear. And, and for any of the folks on the call who joined us last week's um, conversation with the folks from New Hampshire, there's a recurring theme here when collective action is often the best kind of nudge for advocacy for wider industry support um, amongst funders. So um, that's really great. Um, one, one other thing I wanted to look up from earlier, um, which I think is a question that comes up pretty often when we do these case studies, you know, Chicago is a really, has a really robust media ecosystem. Um, and so folks who may be in smaller markets, uh, may be wondering, you know, how they could maybe bring this to their community. So what are the maybe unique, um, uh, things that make this possible in Chicago and what are some lessons learned from this that folks could take to their their own communities? Um, well, I always think that I, I like to say that um, part of its success it really is um, Tracy's connection to to funders, various funders, and the, these relationships she's been cultivating for for a long time. I think that was really um, a key factor in it too. I think she also mentioned uh, the fact to have a full-time staffer just solely dedicated to this is a really important part. Um, I was really able to just focus on all the little detail that kind of goes into these campaigns as well. Um, I think Chicago also has always just naturally been like the type of city that's very, um, like we really have roots in like believing in community and then believing in like collaboration. I think just Chicago as a city is always naturally inclined in that direction. Um, but not, Tracy or Savannah, if you all have anything else to say, I, I think those yeah. are the you know, biggest ones. I would say the journalism space in the last five to 10 years has become more collaborative. New generation of journalists, I think are less competitive as the resources dwindle. Um, people yeah. realize we need to collaborate more in the journalism space. Um, Chicago is a, a town of philanthropy. You know, the MacArthur Foundation is based here. Um, we have good family foundations here. Um, so there's there's not a, you know, one size fits all solution to the work. This may not work in other areas, but I do think it's replicable in cities like Atlanta, Detroit, um, Dallas, Houston area, um, ones kind of mid to large size that have a wide range of community and ethnic media. 
Um, that's where the funders, I think, would see that this could uplift the ecosystem. But even small rural areas like downstate Illinois getting 20 downstate papers together, maybe through the Illinois Press Association to do some kind of collaborative fundraising could work. Um, I just wanted to, I have another question, but draw to the conversation, attention to the conversation in the chat about um, that SEMA doesn't actually hold any payment and using Stripe and the um, uh, crossover fund to, to handle the donations. At the Lundfest Institute, we, a number of years ago now, funded a small experiment on a shared membership campaign, and that was the big sticking point and the big challenge that they couldn't figure out um, the, the funding aspect of it, and so it evolved into a shared marketing campaign, which was successful, but not their initial goal, so I, I think that's really exciting that you um, figured that out. One of the other questions I wanted to ask though also, which we touched on a little bit in the chat was, um, I think it's really exciting that member, there are for-profit and non-profit members um, involved. And so I'd be curious how you handle that because traditionally, I think many of us think that a donation is uh, tax deductible to a non-profit, but would be curious to learn more about how you're able to support both for-profits and non-profits. Yeah, we decided early on that the funding community needed to fund community media regardless of the model. And luckily some foundations were thinking that way. So we made it very clear to people that when they donate to the individual donations are not tax deductible. Even if you're picking the nonprofit outlet, um, if the nonprofit outlet wants to go to the extra step and communicate directly with that donor this year and work on that, they can do that. But we on the front end say that there's no guarantee and the average donation is under hundred bucks. So it's not like most of these people are donating for the tax deductible, the foundations are. So that means our grant writer at the reader writes the grants, uploads it through Crossroads Funds portal with MacArthur or whatever foundation it is. In some cases, we had a new funder this year, Square One, that gave $50,000, 25,000 for the match and 25,000 to SEMA for overhead costs. So they did the payment to the reader and then we're turning around and giving that money to Crossroads Fund to give it to the match. So that's rare. We usually try to write the grants for Crossroads, upload through their portals so that the funding goes directly to Crossroads for the matching money. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I think the, the logistics of all of this are, are fascinating. Um, and so thank you for, for getting into that. We are just about back at the top of the hour. So um, if anyone has any last minute question or, or comment, feel free to raise your hand and, and jump in or, or jump in the chat. Um, can give a second for that. Um, thank you, Tracy, for dropping your email in the chat. We are going to share a recording, the slides, and a bunch of amazing resources that the team here um, produced um, to share more about what they learned. Um, so look for that in your inbox either later today or more likely on Monday. But um, if anyone else has any questions, um, we're just going to wrap it up. And so I just really want to say thank you to Savannah and Yasmin and Tracy for sharing your wisdom and expertise um, and being so willing to um, share with this broader community. And so we hope hopefully to maybe have you back later this fall to share what you learned um, uh, for this year's campaign. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks everyone for taking time out of your day to join us as well. Thank you. Thanks thank everyone. You. Take care. Thank you.